here we are. Hello, teachers. Hello, kids. Hello, everybody. Today, I'm by myself. I can't hide behind my author buddies today. I have to do it myself. Due to some technical difficulties, one of my illustrators is going to come on and he's, he, he can't make it. But that's okay. We have plenty to talk about. I have talked about who would win books a lot. And if you look on my, my Twitter, Instagram, uh, YouTube, whatever, you would see that uh, I, I've been reading my online. I've been reading my who would win books. So there's all my who would win books. But today I wasn't going to talk about my who would win books. Today I was going to talk about um, my other, some other books I wrote. So people who know me for my who would win books might not know that when I started my career, I started out writing alphabet books. So I was really an alphabet book writer for 25 years. I have, I think I counted one day, 29 alphabet books, all nonfiction full of facts. So the other thing is one day I decided I wanted to write uh, some short stories. What happened is I was asked by John Sheska, the stinky cheese man. I was asked by John Sheska to write a story in Guys Read. So I wrote a story in Guys Read. And uh, what I didn't realize is that when he asked me to write a short story, I really had 70 stories in my head. So that's what happened. All of a sudden, I realized there were all these stories from growing up at the ocean. I'm really an ocean guy. I grew up at the beach every summer next to my Nana. And I had a lot of, I have 70 first cousins. So here's what happened. I thought in my head, why don't I write a story for every cousin? So I called the book Ocean Cousins. The first Ocean Cousins book is right here. And it only has, um, you can find it on my website. It only has uh, 30 stories. So um, you might think I wrote this in five seconds. No, I worked on, so I wrote 70 to 80 stories. I was trying to weed out. I was from a family of 10. My father was from a family of five. One of the stories, um, I'll read a section of it and everybody in the town could go look at it. So I got on my little bike and I ran down to see this giant shark. And of course, I was when I looked in his mouth, I was just... How the Coast Guard heard that there was a lobster boat in trouble. The helicopter was a big Coast Guard cutter. The cutter arrived. We learned that a cutter... Coast Guard scuba divers could dive overboard and under Coast Guard guys decide to tow the boat, the traps, the ship line, and the inner harbor by the Coast Guard station. The lobster boat touched bottom and lurched sideways. There was a lot of splashing around. So there you go. That's a little story that I wrote and I'm telling you that my grandmother used to collect sneakers and put them in bushes. Uh, someone closed their car door, a, a sneaker fell out, or, um, you know, collecting sneakers. We don't know what's going on. It's there. All 70 of us were never there. Although recently, I have four kids and my kids under five years old. So there's kids everywhere at the beach. Either. So what happened? Nana says, come on, we're going clamming. Pulls on and told me I should write I should write this as a picture book. Imagine this. Uh, 30 kids with 60 different sneakers. So there you go. And um, um, I thought I this is a song my Uncle Tony used to sing. A clam and we will go. We don't know where the cohogs grow, but a clam and we will go. And we used to sing back to him. Uncle Tony Baloney ate some macaroni, ate some pepperoni, and a clam, and we will go. So off we go. We go clamming. And guess what we learned? Clams are bivalves. They squirt water. So um, we we would go over to each other, cousins, and go, shh, shh, and squirt. And, of course, we thought it was pee. It's not pee. But we had clam pee fights. Shh, shh. It's just the water. A clam pulls the water in, eats the little microbes, spits the water back out. So there you go. You learned about clam pee. You learned about my Nana. I was going to read a section somewhere here, and I forget where it was that I was going to read. But um, let's see. Um, I guess I can't find where I was going to go. I guess I'll read this part. Ready? Uh, our clamming adventure was great, but we walked too far, dug too, dug too long, had many clam pea fights, and ate too many clams for supper. That night, my mom had it easy. All seven kids in my family fell asleep in two seconds. Debbie fell asleep, too. In the middle of the night, she was really thirsty. The cottage made strange, squeaky sounds, and she was afraid to get up and go to the bathroom for a drink. 
In the dock, she reached around the table next to her bed. She found a glass. She put it to her mouth and had a big drink. Then she went back to sleep. The next morning when the sun came up, I remembered the great day I had hanging out with my Nana, clamming and wearing funny sneakers. Debbie woke up too. Then she looked over at the glass she drank out of the night before. Nana's false teeth were sitting in the glass. So isn't that a happy story? So um, another story is that my cousin Arthur, who was always a character, caught a huge lobster. You know, we, we as kids all had lobster traps. In fact, I wrote a book called Going Lobster. And um, what happened is Arthur one day came in in his boat and he had this giant lobster, maybe eight or 10 pounds that he caught. And he tied a fishing line around the lobster and he handed it to me and said, this is my pet, Ethel. Take her for a walk. So he goes, I'm going to go anchor my boat. So I'm holding a lobster on the beach. A crowd gets around. I look like a weirdo. Most people have dogs. He, I had a lobster. Then Arthur came in. He, he, he anchored his boat. He swam in. He came in. And this is what happened. Some old man said, are you going to eat that lobster? She's my pet, Arthur said. Would you eat your dog? A kid said, is that really your pet? Arthur said, in situate, we walk lobsters all the time. It keeps me in shape. The kid was fooled. Arthur had never actually done this before. What do you feed your lobster? Another kid asked. I go to the pet store and I buy lobster food, Arthur said. Does your dog like the lobster? An old lady asked. Arthur said, people that have dogs are weirdos. I don't have a dog. Lobsters are man's best friend. Arthur, Arthur had lied again. Arthur had lied again. He did have a dog, a big smelly mutt named Toby. Arthur was attracting a crowd. At first, all the beach people thought he was strange. But after a few wise guy comments, they started to believe that he really did. He really did this on a regular schedule. I heard a kid ask his mom if he could get a lobster as a pet. Another kid asked mom if he could get a lobster pet for Christmas. Someone from a foreign country said he had never heard of such a thing. Arthur said, in America, we do this all the time. So there you go. There's a little piece of that story. And then uh, I'm going to keep going, telling little chunks. So this is a book I wrote, a bunch of short stories. Someone said to me, why don't you write a novel? And the answer is, I don't think I have the patience to sit that long. I'm more of a fidgety ADD type guy who likes writing picture books. But I did, I did um, write, write these short stories. Uh, another story I like that I won't read, but I'll tell you the story, is one day we went down the beach and we, we, there was a goosefish dead on the beach. So I'll show you what a goosefish looks like in a second. Let me just put this down and grab one of my books. Uh, it'll just take me a second. I'm sure it's here somewhere. Uh, hey, you want to see what a goosefish looks like? This is what a goosefish looks like. Um, it looks like that. It's like a giant mouth with a tail. So there's a goosefish. So one time we all walked down the beach and my cousin Beth was there and she's like, ah! she couldn't believe it. She thought it was like a monster and she was afraid. So somebody asked, I had an uncle that was a scientist. He was a little crazy. And we go, hey, uncle. We ran and got him. Hey, uncle, tell us what this fish is. He goes, oh, that's a goosefish. Run up the house, get a knife, and we'll cut it open, see why it died. So this fish had washed up on the beach. He cut it open, and a seagull, a bird, huge, fell out. So here was a fish that swallowed a bird. It was another lesson for us kids. You know what I think about growing up at the ocean? Someone once said to me, the ocean was your classroom. That's why you started writing books. The ocean was your classroom. And that's how you learned about all these different creatures. So uh, another story, by the way, think about that. I'm like 10 years old, eight years old when that happened. We caught the, we found the goosefish dead. I'm now 32 years old. I decide to write a book in the ocean. Right in my head, I think, I got to put a goosefish in this book because the goosefish was so cool when I was a kid. I never forgot about how amazing it was. So at our beach, sometimes uh, when there's no wind, these little tiny bugs bite us. When it's windy, they don't bite us. For some reason, they can't find us or they hide themselves. I don't really know. So we call them, uh, well, some people call them no-see-ems. Some, 
Some people call them midges. In the book, I say this, midgets, no seeings, midges, sand fleas, midgerinos, flying teeth. So um, there you go. And I'm going to read a section of the book. So when midges start biting at the beach, it, it's so bad. It, it's like you can't take it. That's how bad it is. One day, the midges were so bad, we put on socks and pants and long sleeve shirts over our bathing suits. We also put on Red Sox caps. We went up the beach and the midges started attacking our ankles, wrists, and necks. It really hurt. We even wore turtleneck shirts, but the midges still got us around our ears. Then we asked Grandpa for one of his cigars. He lit it up. He, we waved it around, and that didn't work. Cigar smoke did nothing. We think it even attracted more midges. Bug spray didn't work. Nana said try lemon juice. Smelling like lemonade didn't work. Nothing worked. We decided to make up a little song. In your mouth, up your nose, in your eyes, on your toes, midgey midgies everywhere, even in your underwear. So there you go. There's a song I used to th sing with my cousins. We Tia, one of my cousins, finally figured out a way to escape the midgies. She was brilliant. She threw off her cap, ripped off her clothes, down to her bathing suit, swimsuit, ran to the ocean and dove in, splashed. Take that, you miserable midgies. We all followed her, cousin after cousin, splash, splash, splash. It worked every time. So that's how we got rid of the midges. We just jumped in the water. Uh, another story I like to tell is about squid. One day, the whole beach was covered with squid. You know, we wake up, we run down the beach. The beach is covered with squid. And there's so many that we couldn't walk without stepping on them. Of course, today, everybody eats calamari. Back then, we didn't really know what the squids were. So, um, by the way, if you squeeze a squid like this, uh, ink comes out of it. So instead of having clam pea fights, we had ink fights. Walk up to your cousin, squirt ink at him. Of course, we thought the ink was poison. But you know what we learned? We learned that um, the ink... Uh, the ink is actually used in food. So they use it to cala pasta. They use it as a sauce in Italy. We never knew that. Our grandmother never did, never really did that. All right, but here we go. I was gonna read a, 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 read a piece of this. So um, we end up, hold on a second, hold on. There, am I right there? I got one of those Java updates right in the middle. <laughs> Right in the middle of the show. So I told him, hey, come come another time. Um, so um, here's a piece of the story about the squid. So we would have squid squirting squid fights. By the way, it's never happened again. I only remember it happened once that the whole beach was covered with squid. Another day, the whole beach was covered with jellyfish, you know. And, of course, there's plenty of days where the beach is just covered with seaweed. So the beach was always a great place to learn about the ocean. So uh, we, had, we had fights back and forth, you know. So here we go. The girls came back and asked for a truce. No more squid squirting. We all agreed. Peace, love, happiness, no more squid fights. The truce lasted for about five minutes. Cousin Kevin dissected a few squid until he had a pile of guts. Then like a tiger, he pounced on my sister Mickey and said, no squid ink fights is fine with me, but how about squid gut shampoo? Kevin took a handful of squid guts and rubbed it, rubbed it all over her hair. Her head was ear-to-ear -ear squid guts. Mickey screamed. Nana came down the beach and told Mickey the squid was good for her. It was protein, and to have a full head of beautiful hair, you need protein. Mickey said she would get even someday. Then she jumped in the ocean, washed all the squid guts off her head. She looked great. The squid guts brought us natural hair coloring and natural shampoo. Does anyone have seaweed for some conditioner. So there, that's how that story ends. Uh, I got a couple more. One of the stories I love to tell, but I'm not gonna read it, is that when the old steamers came into Boston, they would pass situate and uh, their, their boilers were full of coal and the coal would heat up, burn and boil the water and the water would cause the steam, which got the engine to go. So, um, um, as they're coming into Boston, they have to cool the boilers down. So they would shovel the hot coals overboard. 
So guess what happened? They shoveled them on top of the fishing grounds and they shoveled them, you know, out to sea. Well, over the years, coal washed in or coal was dragged up by the fishing boats. And some people could heat their houses with the coal that was left over from the, the boilers being shoveled out, the hot coals. And a, a piece of uh, coal, uh, coal would wash up on the beach and half of the side was burnt and the other half was smooth, you know, like it just came out of the mine. So my uncle, the scientist, Sonny, my uncle Sonny would say, see, this side's burned because it was on fire in the boiler and this side's cooled off. Some guy shoveled that over a hundred years ago, went in the water, cooled off, and it was preserved. So that's a story about coal. Um, another story uh, is about basking sharks used to come. So uh, basking sharks have little tiny teeth. They're filter feeders. They're like baleen whales. They only eat little tiny stuff. So if you jumped in the water with a basking shark, he's not going to swallow you or bite you. He's just a basking shark, but it's the second largest shark on earth. So when people see them, they're petrified. So one day a basking shark came in the bay and swam by. And then another basking shark came in the bay and swam by. And then another one came by. They were like two or 300 yards behind each other. For some reason they were patrolling the coast. So uh, there's a story about the basking sharks in here. I do remember what we learned was a shark can hear you from the front but we don't think they can hear you from the back. So my father would sneak up on them with his boat right up to their tail. And then he would touch their tail and they would die. One time they dove and slap and this giant tail slap, <coughs> slap my mother in the arm. So I wrote a little story about basking sharks. So we, they closed the beach that day because of the sharks. So this is what we said to the, uh, this is what we said to the lifeguards. So lifeguards told us we couldn't swim. So after chasing basking sharks for a couple of hours, we went back to our mooring in the harbor. We walked home. The beach was still closed for swimming. Cindy and Mickey mimicked Uncle Sonny and said to the lifeguards, they are basking sharks, built to feeders that pose no danger to the swimmers on Peggotty Beach. The lifeguard said, get lost, you kids. I said, seriously, listen. They are basking sharks, filter feeders that pose no danger to the swimmers. They don't eat people. But why would that anyone listen to us? We were just a bunch of kids. Another time, a dead whale washed up on our beach. The illustrator did a pretty cool job illustrating. There's the dead whale, right? Whoop. There's the dead whale right there, washed up on our beach. So um, we think the whale was about 100 years old. Someone said you... Can't tell how old a whale is. Someone else told us it was 100 years old. The New England Aquarium came and checked out the whale. And uh, there was something my uncle said. said uh, he said, uh, this is what I said. Wow, what a creature. You can only imagine what her life was like swimming all over the world. One of the scientists said the humpback whale could live 100 years. That means this whale could possibly remember whaling. Uncle Sonny started lecturing us. He told us whales are intelligent mammals, and maybe this whale saw a mass slaughter of her pals, and she had no respect for humans. It is a new era. Maybe whales will remember people being gentle and uh, respectful. So there you go. There's a whale that washed up on our beach. You know, we waited and waited to see what they would do with the whale. They tried burying it. It's too big. Then they tried. Then they thought, we'll bring it to the dump. Too big. Finally, a big Coast Guard boat came. I remember this. It backed up as close to shore as it could. They threw a big rope onto shore. They wrapped it around the tail of the whale and they dragged the tail out to sea. So uh, it, there's a story about the giant whale. And um, I guess that's all I would t talk about today as far as, as, far as the um, ocean cousins. There you go. But I'm an alphabet book guy. And I started out my career writing alphabet books. So all you teachers out there, someone told me alphabet books were coming back in kindergarten. And they were going to start using them again to teach the kids letters. So <clears throat> my books are full of facts. I think some of the old alphabet books were used to teach phonics, like A for apple, what's the A sound? B for ball, what's the B sound? C for uh, cat, what's the C sound? But 
The books I was writing were full of facts and information like G is for goosefish. So my theory was the kids would rather see a goosefish than an apple in a book. I just thought they'd like to see something exciting. So here's a bunch of my books for you teachers out there, our kids that don't know me. I wrote one of construction. There's a construction alphabet book. Uh, here's a boat alphabet book. I grew up in boats. I always wanted to write a boat book. There's a boat alphabet. By the way, my boat alphabet book doesn't sell very well. Nobody knows why. And then uh, here's a frog alphabet book, all amphibians, you know. Um, here's one of crabs. I love catching crabs. I told you about growing up at the beach. I wrote a book of crabs called uh, Wicked Cool Crab Alphabet. I think it's since been renamed. And it, there's a new publisher now, and it's called Crab Alphabet. So uh, here's a book I'm really proud of. I was, I was trying to think of books no one else would think of, you know. So there's a lot of books out there. A lot of books. Someone told me, I don't know if these numbers are correct. I'd have to look them up. Someone told me in the year 2000, they published, the United States published 2,000 children's books. But in the year uh, 2019, they published 32,000. Not sure if that's true, 32,000 titles, but a lot of titles out there. So I'm always trying to think of something different and creative. There's the Eyeball Alphabet book. It's all about eyes. Everything you can think of about eyes. Here's a book of skulls. I wrote a book of skulls, um, animal skulls. And the beauty of skulls is you can look at their teeth and you could probably figure out uh, what they eat. And if you look some more and you look at the shape of their head, you can tell what they are. In fact, that book's a little different. I call this a deductive reasoning book. Here's how the book starts. It starts like this. Uh, well, first of all, there's a wise guy first page. It says, warning. This book contains the alphabet. If you are afraid of the alphabet, do not read any further. So um, obviously, kids would be afraid of the skulls and not the alphabet. But like, see this one? Here's one, ants. So um, I don't tell the reader what the skull is. But Ralph Massiel, the illustrator, did draw a couple of little ants around the skull. But it says... Um, this is a science book about mammal skulls. A skull is the head of a skeleton. Leg bones, arm bones, rib bones, and back bones are not in this book. A is for, we are not telling you. As you read this book, you'll have to use your skull. Actually, what's in your skull? Your brain. Can you guess what animal this is? Think. Its skull is perfectly shaped for eating small, six-legged creatures. So I think it's pretty obvious what that is. There's an anteater. There's an anteater right there. And then B is a baboon. Oops. Hold on a sec. B is the baboon. A baboon skull. And I, I, I point out all the uh, parts of the skull. You know, the eye sockets, the nose, the teeth, the uh, upper jaw, lower jaw, the cranium, and other parts. So there's a book of skulls. And uh, here's one of Spices and Flavors, a book I'm really uh, proud of spices and flavors uh anise basil cinnamon dill eucalyptus fennel garlic ginger it goes like that you know what else is in that book stuff that kids kids stuff that you know about every day coffee mm -hmm. cola cinnamon think of all the flavors mustard think of all the flavors you kids eat you know what i thought when i wrote that book kids don't know where flavors come from so, like, I never knew cinnamon came from the bark of a tree from Sri Lanka, which is an island off of India. I never knew that, you know. And I never knew that coffee started in Ethiopia, and then it was brought to the Arabian Peninsula, then it was brought to Europe, then the Europeans stole some of the coffee plants, and they brought it to South America, they brought it to Hawaii, and they started growing coffee all over the world. I love that book, and I love all the flavors and my mother was a great cook. My wife was a great cook. And all I could think of is all the great flavors in my house. And I said, I got to write a book about it. Uh, here's a book of flowers and a flower alphabet book. Um, I got the idea for that when I went to the flower show with my quit, my kids. All right. Uh, <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm getting text message. I mean, I'm getting message. This is from Lucia, a teacher in Baltimore. Lucia, I know because she's my cousin. So here we go. My cousins are harassing me. Uh, Lucia says, 
Why is your favorite cousin not in the Ocean Cousins book? Seems strange. Don't you agree? Lucia is implying that she's my favorite cousin, but I didn't put her in the book. So I'm saving her for, uh, you know, Ocean Cousins 2. By the way, you kids, should I call it Ocean Cousins 2? Should I call it More Ocean Cousins? Should I call it Second Cousins? Should I call it Meet Me at Belly Button Rock? Because we had a rock called Belly Button Rock. Uh, Lucia, I think I'll put you in the Belly Button Rock uh, story. Uh, another question is, was science one of your favorite subjects in school? No. Gym was my favorite subject in school. Science was not my favorite subject. But, you know, it's really strange. I scored really high in math in the college boards, and I scored really low in English. And here I am, a children's book author. So that doesn't make sense, does it? But it's true. Uh, another question from Susan in Colorado. It says, how do you know all these facts? I didn't know them. I read books. I read books. I read books. Um, and I go to zoos, and I go to aquariums, and I go to museums, and I talk to scientists, and I listen. Plus, I listen to kids. Kids tell me really cool stuff, too. It says, uh, question, when Jerry wants to write an alphabet book, does he do all the research first or ask the publisher if they'd be interested in it? Um, it could be either way. Sometimes I have all the information in my head, like the ocean stuff I already had in my head. But like I would, when, I, when I asked, could I do an eyeball book, I really didn't have the book all written. But they said, yeah, why don't, why don't you do uh, an eyeball book? Someone just wrote in and said, I think you should call it More Ocean Cousins. I don't know. When I visit schools and I'm in front of a big audience of 400 kids, they love Belly Button Rock. I don't know why. So I got to get Belly Button Rock into some title. Of some book somewhere so don't ask me why belly buttons belly buttons one of those funny words like booger underwear eyeballs poop it's just one of those funny words i don't know why belly buttons funny uh here's a book of butterflies butterfly alphabet book here's one uh bugs this is my best selling book it has sold maybe two million copies the, my best selling book ever out of all my books although the who would win uh Killer Whale versus the Great White Shark. That might overtake the Icky Bug Alphabet book. But it's my best-selling book, Icky Bug Alphabet. And um, here's one of dinosaurs. And uh, to be honest with you, I didn't really want to write a dinosaur book because I don't think it's that creative. There's millions of dinosaur books out there. I was trying to create books that nobody had done before. So there's millions of dinosaur books. I didn't really want to do it. But that movie Jurassic Park came out. And my publisher said, you've got to do this. You've got to do this book. So I did it. Hey, here's a few more. Here's one of uh, vegetables. My vegetable book doesn't sell very well. But that's okay. And when I was doing this book, what did I learn? I learned about some vegetables that I never heard of. So uh, here's one right here. i got to find it. Uh, oh, yeah. And by the way, what's the toughest letter when you're writing a vegetable book? Guess what the toughest letter was? People say to me, when you're writing your alphabet books, what's your toughest letter? Well, I don't really always know the toughest letter, what it's going to be, because it's always really different. Uh, here's one, fiddleheads. I love fiddleheads. I eat them when I can. That's when a, a fern is little, a fern, just comes out of the ground like this. When it's just coming out, they cut it, and they, they eat it. It tastes like spinach. And if you wait another few weeks or another week, two weeks, it gets really bitter, and people don't like to eat it. But when it's just come out of the ground, it's really nice and tender. So there. Oh, yeah. What was the toughest letter? D. I couldn't think of a D vegetable. I looked everywhere. No one could think of a D vegetable. Isn't that strange? One kid told me Doritos. And I thought, why didn't I have that? <clears throat> why didn't I have that kid's mother for a mother? He thinks Doritos are vegetables. So, um. I finally found this one, a daikon, which is an Asian radish. So I forget who told me, I forget who told me uh, about the daikon, but there it is right there. D is for daikon. Of course, D is for eggplant. So the book is like that. That's a book of vegetables. Um, here's one of mammals. I wrote a book of mammals. 
And uh, my favorite mammal in the world, of course, is a naked mole rat. I read about the naked mole rat in the newspaper, that it was the biggest attraction at the Cincinnati Zoo. And I thought, wow, that animal must be really cool. So you wonder where I got ideas, that lady who asked me um, where I got ideas uh, or how I research my books. I never would have thought of a naked mole rat, but it was an article in the newspaper. So it, pay, it pays to read, read everything I can. I, get, I read everything I can get my hands on, try to get ideas for some of my books. Uh, when I was working on this book, I learned about another animal, a yapok. Y is for yapok. So I tried to make my book. Sorry about that light right there, you guys. There, I try to get rid of it. Um, there's a yapok, and a yapok is from South America, but it's a marsupial, which means it has a pouch like a kangaroo. So isn't that strange? There's a marsupial from the Americas when most of the marsupials are in Australia. But this is stuff I learned working on my books, working on my books. And I was trying to think if there was another good one in here I really liked. Oh, yeah. I learned I learned about the okapi, which I never heard of before. It sort of looks like a combination of a horse, a zebra, and a giraffe is an okapi. And I've only seen one in a zoo. I've never seen one in, a, in the wild. <coughs> there's a book. Hey, there's another question. Someone wrote, how did the dinosaur book do? It did really well. It sold really well. So uh, my publisher was trying to make money. That's good. I was trying to have a different type of career and do different types of books. But making money is good. Then we can do more books. So um, um, someone called in and said, um, show the high rock, high racks. And uh, here's a high racks. And uh, there you go. Now, someone called in and said, show the hyrax. A hyrax is the only animal I know that's related to the elephant. Now, if you look, if you look, I don't think they're related at all when you look at them. But I guess their bone structure and DNA and all that stuff is very similar. So there's a hyrax. Now, someone called in and said, my mother was bit by a hyrax, some lady named Alice. So, Alice, I'm sorry you got bit by a hyrax. I guess you were in Kenya or something or Africa somewhere, and you went over and said, oh, what a cute little animal. <clears throat> he bit you. So there you go. Um, here's, here's an alphabet book of the desert, because uh, teachers told me, if teachers, if you wonder how I got some ideas, teachers told me the desert in different biomes, a biome is like uh, a type of geography, a uh, type of life form uh, where life lives, you know, like rainforest would be one biome, a desert would be another um, the, the savannas would be another. So, um, I wrote a book of desert creatures, pretty much inspired by teachers telling me, why don't you do the desert? And then here's a book I thought of myself, me and the illustrator love the Beatles, the Beach Boys, the Supreme, the Love and Spoonful. We love, uh, all those, the turtles, the birds, we love all those old rock and roll bands. So naturally we wanted to do a book on the Beatles. Okay. Uh, I still have some more outfit books. I know it's hard to believe, but uh, here's one I did of jets, a jet alphabet. Here's one of airplanes. Airplanes have propellers. Jets have jet engines. That's a difference. Someone said, why didn't you combine the two books? Because I want to have two books. I didn't want to have just one book. And then uh, here's my newest alphabet book called Not a Butterfly Alphabet. And Not a Butterfly Alphabet is a moth book. And the moths are so beautiful, I just had to write a book about them. I mean, look at this right here. I just love this guy. There's a moon, there's a moon moth. Look at that. How do you like the moon moth? He is beautiful. And there's a luna moth, and of course, luna means moth and the moon. And the, on the title page is a luna moth. There's the luna moth right there. So I have the luna moth and the moon moth in the book. And I forget what I did for L. Like, why didn't I do that? Oh, yeah, the leopard moth I love. It reminded me of a Dalmatian. So look at the leopard moth. Isn't he beautiful? Gorgeous, you know? And uh, let's see if a couple more. Um, uh, oh, yeah, this one I just couldn't believe. Here's a moth that looks like lips, green lips, you know? Look at that moth. 
as soon as I saw that, I was like, I got to show that to kids. That has to be in a book, you know? That is really beautiful. Uh, maybe I'll show one more. Uh, trying to think. My favorite was the, some are just so gorgeous, you can't believe it. Like, look at this. That's an emperor moth. Here's the emperor moth. Who knew that moths were more beautiful than butterflies? I always thought of moths as gray. All the moths we had when I was growing up were on the light at the door, and they were always boring. They were always just like gray. But look at this one, a cow moth. Beautiful cow moth. So there's that one. Here's one of, uh, this used to be one of my best-selling books, but it seems to have dropped off. I don't know why. There's the underwater outfit. It's warm water tropical fish. And then look at this. Here's one, uh, sea mammals. So think of just in the ocean. I did crab alphabet. I did sea mammals. I did tropical fish. I did cold water fish. The ocean just is a gift that just keeps giving. And then uh, here's a bird alphabet. And it was voted by Bird is World as one of the best books of the year. So thank you, Bird is World, that magazine. Here's one of Reptiles. It was up for Book of the Year in a few states, a reptile alphabet book. Um, I used to tease my kids that their picture was in the book. So, hey, you want to see what my kids look like? Yeah, that's what I used to do to my kids. I used to say, hey, hey, Jill, I found your picture. There's your picture, Jill. Hey, Maeve. Hey, Sloney. There's your picture. And then um, one day I thought, well, kids know all about dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are extinct. Kids know all about it. So, um, you know, but I read this beautiful book about extinct creatures called It's a Wonderful Life. And it was about how on Earth, 99.9% .9 of all creatures that ever lived are extinct. So I wrote an extinct alphabet book. It used to be one of my best selling books, kind of tailed off recently. But see, um, it used to have pink letters. Teachers in schools, you might find the ones with the pink letters right here. So extinct alphabet, there's no dinosaurs in the book. So for instance, see the Dimetrodon? People think it's a dinosaur, but it's not. I'll explain why. Dinosaurs have legs under their bodies. Look at this guy. His legs are off to the side like an alligator or a crocodile. So he is not a dinosaur. I forget what kind he is. He is a reptile, but I forget what kind he is. And of course, they were flying reptiles. So they're not dinosaurs. Uh, I forget if there's a flying reptile in here. Well, the biggest bird that ever lived is in here. Here it is, a moa. He was 12 feet tall. There's the moa right there. And um, I tried to fill a book full of really interesting creatures. One of my favorites is the hallucinogenia. I might have said it in another show. When the scientists first discovered the hallucinogenia, they thought they were hallucinating. It had like eight legs. It had multiple eyes. It had uh, um, appendages on the top of it that nobody could figure out what it was really like. There's a hallucinogenia. Um, um, all right, let's see. Do I have any more? Oh, yeah. Here's what I did for another company. Here's one on Fenway Park. So I got a call one day and they said, is this Jerry Pilata? Uh, you live in Boston? Yes. We're looking for an author to write a book on Fenway Park. So I got picked because I live in Boston. I tried to, uh, I asked them if I could write um, W's for Wrigley Field, you know, where the Cubs play. They go, no, you're not from Chicago. So they wouldn't let me do that. But I really wanted to do that. Uh, I did do this, teachers. I wrote a Navy alphabet, an Army alphabet. I looked around. Nobody was writing books on the U.S. military, so I wanted to do it. And I did started this in 1999, which was before 911. And it was before my son was really little at the time. He was only, I'll have to think about how old he was. So uh, he was, I don't know, 14, whatever. He didn't go in the Army till later. So um, I started it before my son went in the army. So there you go. There's all, there's all my alphabet books. I did want to show the kids this. My books are 32 pages long. Look right here. Here's a book. This is my moth book. Here it is before it's, print, before it's bound into a book. So they print it like that. See how it looks backwards and upside down and crooked and everything. 
it's not backwards, upside down, and crooked. It's actually perfect. Look at this. Half the book is here. No, a quarter of the book is there. And then a quarter of the book. Whoa. A quarter of the book is there. And a quarter of the book is there. So this whole book was printed on two giant sheets of paper. And you know what they do? Uh, they fold it. So I got to figure out how to fold this one. Okay, I figured it out. So after they print the books, they print the book. And all my books, except the chapter book, did, the short story book, are 32 pages long. So someone said, how long are your books? 32 pages long. So I'm going to show you something. Like that. Fold it that way. And you fold it this way. And you fold it this way. And then you fold it this way. Uh, there's half the book right there. So that's how they do it. Okay? The other half of the book's right here. This is what you got to do. You got to keep the title. Keep the title on the outside. That's the trick. So I keep the title on the outside. I line it up. See how I'm doing. Line it up right there. I fold it. I fold it. And I fold it. Hope it's not taking too long. Keep kids, that's how they print books for all of you out there that don't know this. So, uh, teachers, if you write a letter to me, my address is in my website, I'll send you one of these. So, here you go. That's called a press sheet. There's the whole book. Look, there's the title page. Half the book's here, half the book's there. LM. LM is in the middle. Look, LM. So I folded it properly. And what's the last page? Z is Z. So what do they do after that? They put the cover on. By the way, I did write a fraction book called the Hershey Fraction Book for you teachers out there. Might not know me. And then what happens? They put the cover on. That's the wrong cover. We don't care. We're being goofy. So then they staple it, or they stitch it, or they glue it. And the last thing they do is cut the extra paper off. Actually, the, uh, the right cover is right here. It is the right cover. So, ready? There's the cover right there. All right, there's some more questions here. It says, what is belly button rock? Belly button rock is a giant rock, like as big as a pickup truck, that was near our beach that... Actually, it had a drilling hole in it from when they drilled it out of a mine or something. So when we looked at it, it looked like the rock looked like a guy's chest with a belly button. So we call it belly button rock. So if you come to the beach, any of you teachers out there or kids, uh, um, someone said, oh, my <laughs> another cousin. My cousin Paula says, I think you should talk about the paint chapter in Ocean Cousins. Well, back to Ocean Cousins for a second. When we were kids, we'd take green rocks and we'd smash them and smash them until they were powder. Then we would take black rocks and we would smash them and smash them until they were powder. And then we would take uh, red rocks and we'd smash them and smash them. And then we took water and we mixed it and we made paint. So you could put green, black, red, you know, we could put a, uh, we made paint. So Paula must have great memories when she was a kid of making paint. And by the way, I have to thank my cousin, Johnny Lewis, who uh, was my age. And Johnny's the one who reminded me of making paint. I'd forgotten all about it, but it was a big part of growing up. Hey, there you go. We put the right cover on and then look, they cut it. That's how the book is printed. So kids out there, here's a little lesson for you teachers. How would I really start a book if I started it? If I was writing an alphabet book, how would I really start it? I would start it like this. I would get a piece of paper. So I'm just like you kids. And look, I would write one, two, three, four, all the way to 32. All the way to 32. Because the books are 32 pages long. And then look up here. It says title page. It says copyright page. Then the book actually starts, actually starts on page three. Someone said, does the book start on page one? No, it starts on page three. So title page, copyright page, page A, B, C, D, all the way to <clears throat> Z. Uh-oh, look at this. The books are 32 pages long. The alphabet is 26 letters long. 
You know what that means? I have four extra pages. Look at this. One, two, three, four extra pages. So I could do things with the extra pages. For instance, teachers, what did I do in, um, in the, um, in the uh, moth book? I taught the life cycle of a moth. So there's a page that teaches the life cycle of a moth. But that's only two pages, so I have two more extra pages. So what did I do? I decided one day I would do two things. I would, um, I don't know where it went. Hold on, hold on a sec. Uh, I decided I would show animals that have scales because butterflies have scales on their wings. People say to me, the word butterfly, uh, the, uh, someone who studies butterflies is a lepidopterist. And by the way, when I was writing these books, I met a lepidopterist named Brian Cassie. So Brian Cassie, if you're out there, thank you for all the butterfly stuff you taught me. You were awesome. Thank you. And um, I also learned the animals that have scales. So here we go. Ready? There's a mammal that has scales. <clears throat> He's been in the news lately because they think, I'm sorry, they think he carries the virus. So there it is right there, a pangolin. You kids, look up a pangolin. That is an amazing creature, a pangolin. And then if you look, uh, moths have scales on their wings. And of course, lizards have scales. There's a lizard. And I was trying to think of a fancy way. I told the illustrator to do this. I acted as the art director on this book. So if you look, she put a circle here and... She put a, uh, what is what is that shape there? She put an oval, woo, an oval here. And then she put a, what is that? Uh, is that a trapezoid? Oh, a, a pentagon there. And then over here, she put a square with the snake. Snakes have scales. And then fish have scale, fish have scales. She put a rectangle. And then um, a trapezoid on the, armadillo they have scales and uh butterflies have scales and she did a triangle on a butterfly so i never mentioned the shapes i just did it for fun let's see what i did with the four extra pages in that book so i thought you i thought you'd like to see that in the in the uh butterfly book just to explain my career and my writing and all that sort of stuff um, whoa um let me get this book out right here um in the in the uh, in the book beetle book, one of the pages we put a spider, but I just wanted to teach one thing. I'm always into teaching the teachers. Uh, what could I do to make the classroom a little happier? Like what could I teach? So uh, spiders don't have wings. Spiders have eight legs. Beetles have wings. Beetles have six legs. So that's what I taught on that page. And then on another page, uh, I put a bee in the book. And um, in the, in, I put a bee with those extra pages because a bee has its wings on the outside. He can't fold them back underneath like a beetle. A beetle folds its wings back inside. A bee does not. So that was another lesson I taught. And then here's a pretty cool lesson, uh, teachers, kids. Um, if you look at this, here's a cockroach. And a cockroach is not a beetle. Beetles have a straight line down their back. Let me just look for a second. Yeah, see the straight line? Beetles have a straight line down their back. There's a tiger beetle. It has a straight line down its back. There's an underwater beetle. It has a straight line down its back. I'll show you one more. So beetles have, oh, look at the uh, June bug. He's a beetle. He has a straight line down its back. Now look at the, uh, look at the um, uh, cockroach. He does not have a straight line down his back. His wings overlap. Other top teachers, here's a beetle. Let me see if I can do this. Here's a beetle. Their wings line up and open like the space shuttle doors, right? That's a beetle. And then a bug has an X, X. They cross their wings like that. Like a stink bug, he doesn't have a straight line. He has an X. And then I guess I should go like that. A cockroach is overlap like this. So there's a cockroach, there's a stink bug, and there's a beetle. So kids, that's a pretty good lesson. You can learn the different things of those insects. And then, um, let's see. There was one other thing I wanted to show you. 
Yes, we hid Beatles songs in the Beatles. I'll, I'll show you stuff we did for fun. So it's a, today we're talking about children's literature, books that I wrote. If you look really closely, I don't know if I can do it, it says, Love Me Do. We hid Beatles song titles in the Beatles. Right there it says, Love Me Do. Want to see another one? Here's another one. It says, if you look in the shot, not the shadow, the shine of the beetle right there. If you look in the shine, I'll try to be steady. It says, oh, darling. Oh, oh, darling. You know that song? So then another one is um, uh, one that I love to show. Look at this one right there underneath here. It says, help. Whoops, I got to get rid of that thing. Right there it says, help. So there's another Beatles song. So that's something we did in the books. We hid, we hid things. And then I wanted to show uh, something from the Skull Book, if I can find it. Yeah. In the Skull Book, we hid presidents. So if you want to see one, yeah, um, look right here, and you can see one. There is Calvin Coolidge right there. There's Calvin Coolidge. Oops, sorry. Is Calvin Coolidge right there? And then uh, I'll see. If, I'll see if we can find another one. I think that's Rutherford B. Hayes on the top of the banana. There is Rutherford B. Hayes. And then on another one, you can see this one's easy. Ready? On the dog skull page. Here's a dog skull. There's Lincoln, Washington, Jefferson. There's three presidents right there. And who else is in here? Um, oh, yeah. Is Obama in there? Yeah, there he is right there. See him? We put Obama right there. Ronald Reagan's over here. There's Ronald Reagan in the cactus right there. There's Ronald Reagan. So we hid, we hid, th we hid things in the, uh, um, we hid things in the books. Hey, you know what? I talked for almost an hour. I think I, um, I, I answered most of the questions. Let's see if there's any more. I don't see any more. Uh, I, I think uh, I miss my author buddies. Hopefully they'll be back tomorrow. Thank you all my author buddies who appeared with me last week. Jack Gantos, Roland Smith, Stuart Murphy, David Bedricki, Carmen Didi, uh, Mike Shoulders, Mike Artell, um, I hope I didn't forget anyone. Mary Ann Coca Leffler. Um, if I forgot someone, Broad Baggart. Thank you, all my author buddies who appeared on my show. We're going to try to keep it going. So I'll be here tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Thank you, everybody. I hope you like the show. Keep smiling. It's tough out there being by ourselves, not being in school. But I thought I would do as much as I could to help the kids and the teachers. So we're going to keep going. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a nice day.